Thank you all for coming today uh, to this seminar on the aesthetics of the humanities towards a poetic knowledge production. Um, so let me see. Oh, I have to go back to... So this is the second seminar we have organized here as part of the Disrupting the Humanities seminar series at the Center for Disruptive Media. Um, the videos from the first seminar are all finalized now and will be uploaded to the website very soon. So if you weren't able to make that one, make sure to check out the uh, website soon. So what we're going to do in this seminar, in this seminar we want to focus on questions of form, aesthetics and poetics in our systems and practices of humanities knowledge production. So the increasing use of digital tools and interfaces to represent scholarly materials has once again drawn our attention to the importance of aesthetics in the humanities and the digital humanities. So digital technologies and media have brought with them new possibilities for re representing our research, to both extract and represent data, as well as to publish our work in different forms and formations online. So from blogs to social media to multimodal publishing platforms such as Scalar and Inflections. So what does this mean for the way we experience our research and the way our research is experienced? What other forms of expression might suit our writing practices better? And what is the relation here between aesthetic expression and knowledge? In this respect, imagining how creativity, reasoning, interpretation and aesthetics are intrinsically entangled would be the start of a critique of what can still be seen as one of the major oppositions structuring humanity scholarship. This is an opposition between, on the one hand, more rationalistic, conceptual and objectifying tendencies in knowledge production and representation, and on the other hand, the role played by subjectivity, artfulness, feeling, experience and sensory aspects in research practices, as well as in the media of dissemination and communication. So new data visualization tools and methods have been important in triggering this critique. These tools and methods offer alternative ways of representing information and of thinking about information aesthetics or infostatics. But what does this mean for our conventional ways of reading, understanding and analyzing data and information? What is the role of design and aesthetics in knowledge formation? And what is lost or gained at the hand of these new ways of extracting and representing data? So digital humanists have increasingly adopted visualization tools in their work, from infographic and simple data visualizations such as Wordle to sophisticated GIS maps. So we can now create interactive visualizations and dynamic maps of large cultural data sets to find new patterns and to potentially generate new theoretical questions. Traditional boundaries disappear as visualizations can be seen as aesthetic statements about the world and as form of forms of art. See, for instance, Stephanie Posovich's Writing Without Words, which is a project that uses various graphic approaches to analyze the structure and themes of On the Road by Jack Kerouac. So in this process of adapting information visualization tool from the sciences, however, it is just as important, as Gary Hall has argued, to bring humanist methods to the digital, where we need to explore what the humanities have to offer in this respect to the digital and or to scientific methods and forms of computation. So this seminar will then examine how such developments relate to the humanities in particular, as a field with a history of resistance to more visual forms of knowledge representation and production. Here, as Joanna Drucker argues, an underlying fear for the subjective, the intuitive and the speculative comes to the fore, favoring the logical and systematic where it comes to knowledge re representation, which, as she argues, might be useful for the sciences, but perhaps not for more intuitive and interpretive fields such as the humanities. So this conservatism on the part of the humanities is intrinsically bound up with its textual condition, or what Jessica Pressman calls it aesthetics of bookishness. Here the book cannot only be seen as a technology, a medium or an interface, but also as an influential aesthetic form, evident from an ongoing focus on textuality and the book-bound reading object. But putting the materiality of the book at the center as such, in forms of what can be seen as post-digital or hybrid forms of publishing, doesn't always necessarily imply a nostalgia for print. But this exploration of bookishness can also take the form of a cultural critique and more emphasis on the active agency and performativity of the printed book. 
these two, for instance, explore our changing digital world and to think beyond the economies of print and digital. For instance, as Alessandra Ludovico has argued, in a post-digital print culture, paper publishing is, can be used as a new form of avant-garde social networking that, thanks to its analog nature, is not so easily controlled by the digital data gathering. At the same time, however, the multimodality of the digital medium has fueled the idea that scholarly content is separate from its material instantation or presentation. There is a felt need to again emphasize how a media's materiality or specific format influences its meaning and use. From this point of view, if we pay more attention to the performative aspects of, ma aspects of materiality, of media and of design, we might be more receptive to seeing the ideology that is inherent in our representations and the politics that is instantiated in our continued practical iteration of these representations. Interface are not more merely representing our information and data, they are creating and inter interpreting it too. Design is not only about turning cognitive materials into visual, when, as Catherine Hills has argued, in acts of medial translation, so for instance from print to digital, interpretation already takes place. Yet how is this interpretation being represented and performed? And how is information's meaning altered through its conditions of use, reading and interpretation? In which way can we assure that we as scholars, throughout the research process, focus on the medial forms, formats and graphic spaces, in and through which we communicate and perform scholarship, as well as on the discourses, agencies and institutions that shape and determine our scholarly practices? So this contextual discussion, focusing on the materiality of our scholarship and its material modes of production, is and should not in any way be separate from a discussion on the content of our work. So one response would be to extend our visual epistemologies by stimulating humanist training in visual representation, interface critique and design tools and methodologies. Related to that, Tara McPherson argues that we as scholars should be more interested in the actual design, visualization and performance of our materials. How can we as scholars be more involved in designing, writing and forms of communication and publishing that better accommodate visual materials and that allow new relationships between visual materials and anal analysis, between data and interpretation, to explore a new poetics of scholarship? So this seminar series is accompanied by a wiki or a resource platform where resources related to the theme of the seminars as well as the recordings and materials of the various seminars will be brought together for reuse in research and education. As it is a wiki, everyone will be able to add his or her own material, which will hopefully turn into a rich collection of resources. So if any one of you has the feeling that they want to add something uh, that might be relevant to the topics or themes of this seminar, please do go to the website and add what you like. Um, for those of you who are using Twitter, the hashtag that we will be using during this event is disruptive media. And you can also use this if you want to ask a question to one of the speakers or to the panel as a whole, uh, as I will be monitoring the Twitter feed during the event. So this is the schedule for today. We're running slightly late, I think. Um, so after my introduction, Aaron Manning will be speaking then CERN will be speaking, and after that we'll have a short discussion. Then there will hopefully be coffee and tea. Um, and then afterwards in the second panel we'll have Joanna and Silvio followed by a discussion again. All right. So now I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Aaron. So if you could put the pretzi on for Aaron and get mine away. Uh, so Aaron Manning holds a university research chair in relational art and philosophy in the Faculty of Fine Arts at Concordia University in Montreal in Canada. She's also the director of the SENS Lab, which is a laboratory that explores the intersections between art practice and philosophy through the matrix of the sensing body and movement. In her art practice, she works between painting, dance, fabric and sculpture. Current iterations of her artwork explore emergent collect collectivities through participatory textiles. Her project Stitching Time will be presented at the 2012 Sydney Biennale and the Knots of Time will open the new Flax Museum in Kortrijk, Belgium in 2014. I think that, is that open or well? Yeah. 
So her writing addresses movement, art, experience, and the political through the prism of process philosophy, with recent work developing a notion of autistic perception and the more than human. So publications include Relationscapes, Movement, Art, and Philosophy, Politics of Touch, Sense, Movement, and Sovereignty, and Ephemeral, ephemeral Territories, representing nation, home, and identity in Canada. Um, her forthcoming manuscript, Al Always More Than One, Individuation Stands, will be published by Duke University Press in 2012, so I'm guessing it's not forthcoming anymore, as will her forthcoming co-written manuscript, Toss in the Act, Passages in the Ecology of Experience. I think that just came out, if I'm correct. So Erin's paper is entitled Against, Me Against Method, and Erin, the floor is yours. So uh, are you going to put up the, uh, yeah. the Prezi? We've got it up. Can you see it? No. Oh, wait. You should be able to see it now, I guess. Yep. Yeah. All right, go ahead. All right, thank you. Um, so you can go ahead and, and uh, click on the first one. Yep. All right. So um, the talk that I'm going to give today is a shortened version of a longer piece called Against Method and is hopefully going to be able to raise the, the key issues in the piece through a kind of recursive exploration of research creation, which is a term that uh, we use in Canada to talk about art-based research, but perhaps more importantly, it's a term that we at the Sense Lab have, sorry, the bus is driving by, have um, taken up to think about the ways in which all forms of experimentation and knowledge uh, include an aspect of making and thinking. So I'll begin. Um, so 10 propositions. One, create new forms of knowledge. Embrace the non-linguistic. Research creation generates new forms of experience. It situates what often seem like disparate practices, giving them a conduit for collective expression. It hesitantly acknowledges that normative modes of inquiry and containment often are incapable of assessing its value. It generates forms of knowledge that are extra-linguistic, it creates operative strategies for a mobile positioning that take these new forms of knowledge into account. It proposes concrete assemblages for rethinking the very question of what is at stake in pedagogy, in practice, and in collective experimentation. Research creation proposes new forms of knowledge, many of which are not intelligible within current understandings of what knowledge might look like. Consider that new processes will likely create new forms of knowledge which may have no means of evaluation within current disciplinary models. Two, practice thinking. Don't be afraid of philosophy. How might a resituating of research creation as a practice that thinks provide us with the vocabulary to take seriously that, quote, philosophical theory is itself a practice just as much as its object? It is no more abstract than its object. It is a practice of concepts, and we must judge it in light of the other practices with which it interferes. That's from Deleuze. This will mean opening thought beyond its articulation and language toward the movement of thought, engaging thought at the imminent limit where it is still fully in the act. Consider that making is a thinking in its own right, and conceptualization a practice in its own right. Think philosophy not as that which frames an already completed process, but as that which has a history of launching its speculative apparatus in relation to modes of knowing beyond its purview, such as artistic practice. Three, make beyond the object, work the work. Take art in its medieval definition as the way. If art is understood as a way, it is not yet about an object, about a form, or about a content. Consider that research creation is less about an object than a mode of activity that is at its most interesting when it is constitutive of new processes. This can only happen if its potential is tapped in advance of its alignments with existing disciplinary methods and institutional structures. This includes creative capital. Take seriously that generating new forms of knowledge implies generating new forms of experience for which there are no pre-given methodologies, for which there is no predetermined value. What research creation can do is propose concrete assemblages for rethinking the very question of what is at stake in pedagogy, in practice, and in collective experimentation. 
Going back to the first proposition, we begin therefore with four thought experiments. One, if art is understood as a way, it is not yet about an object, about a form or a content. Two, making is a thinking in its own right and conceptualization a practice in its own right. Three, research creation is not about objects. It is a mode of activity that is at its most interesting when it is constitutive of new processes. Um, this can only happen if its potential is tapped in advance of its alignments with existing disciplinary methods and institutional structures. Four, new processes will likely create new forms of knowledge which may have no means of evaluation within current disciplinary models. Four, dwell in the transversal, keep moving. The unquantifiable within experience can only be taken into account if we begin with a mode of inquiry that refutes initial categorization. Instead of holding knowledge to what can already be ascertained and measured, let us, as William James suggests, find ways to account not only for the terms of the analysis, but for all that transversally weaves between them. Let us be up to the challenge of radical empiricism as that which begins in the midst, in the mess of relations not yet organized into terms such as subject and object. James calls this field of relations pure experience, pure understood not in the sense of purity, but in the sense of imminent to actual relations. Pure experience is on the cusp of the virtual and the actual, in the experiential register of the not quite yet. It is of experience in the sense that it effectively contributes to how experience settles into what James calls knower known relations. Note that to reorient the real to include that which can be experienced rather than known as such is to profoundly challenge the notion that knowledge is based on quantification. Return to proposition one. This is the force of radical empiricism, that it gives us a technique to work with, the in-act at the heart of experience, providing subtle ways of composing with the shifting relations between the knower and the known, keeping in mind, of course, that the knower is not the human subject, but the way relations open themselves towards systems of subjectification. Five, be speculatively pragmatic, enjoy the process. Speculative pragmatism is key to this process. It's an approach that is interested in the pragmatic force of the conditions of the here and now, but that simultaneously remains oriented to the as yet unknown. A speculative pragmatism takes as its starting point a rigor of experimentation. It is interested in the anarchy at the heart of all process and is engaged with the techniques that tune the anarchical into new modes of knowledge. It is also interested in what escapes the order, and especially in what this excess can do. And it implicitly recognizes that knowledge is invented in the escape, in the excess. Keep in mind that a speculatively pragmatic approach never begins with a preformed subject. A speculatively pragmatic approach takes the event, not the subject, as its point of departure. Its pragmatism is that it remains interested and engaged with all the, that the event can do, which includes how it positions itself in the field of relation. Whitehead's notion of the superject, the subject of the event, is useful here. It emphasizes that the occasion of experience is itself what proposes its own known or known relations, resulting in a subject that is the subject of the experience rather than a subject external to the experience. Experience, it reminds us, is not constituted first and foremost of human relations. Six, invent beyond technique, activate the more than. An account of method is inextricably linked to a belief in reason. In this account, reason functions as an apparatus of capture. It diagnoses, situates, organizes, and ultimately it surveys, judges, and understands. Though methods are always open to change, their task is to reasonably safeguard against the ineffable, that which cannot be categorized, cannot be made to account for itself, and so falls by the wayside. Conscious knowledge is privileged over the pre-linguistic and the pre-conscious. Writing is privileged over speech and certainly over all other kinds of making. Method, however open it may seem in a given context, serves to define knowledge to its core Discipline the very question of what constitutes knowledge. Whitehead seeks to go beyond the Kantian definition of reason toward what he calls the function of reason. Whitehead sees reason not as a content to be allied to a method, 
but as a cut that reorients the field of experience. Reason, he suggests, is the process's appetition for difference. It is what pushes occasions of experience to distinguish themselves from the welter of activity. It is the, quote, counter-agency which saves the world from mere life. This cut is not an end point, not the capture of a process. Reason here no longer belongs to Kant. It has appetite. The cut is operative. It activates potential and sets things in motion. Method, on the other hand, works as a stilling, as an end point. The birth of methodology, Whitehead writes, is in its essence the discovery of a dodge to live. What we need are not methods for curating life, but techniques for living. Techniques create, technique creates the conditions for repetition, bringing rigor to the system. Technique is necessary to the art of thought, to thought in the act, but it is not art in itself. The key is to go to the heart of technique, close reading, engaged exploration of material, and then to go further still. Outdo technique. This is what I call technicity. Technicity is the modality for creating out of a system of techniques, the more than of system, the experience of the works opening to its excess, to its more than. Technique and technicity coexist. Where technique engages the repetitive practices that form a composing body, be it organic or inorganic, Technicity is a set of enabling conditions that exact from technique the potential of the new for co-composition. Think technicity as the process that stretches out from technique, creating brief interludes into the more than of technique, gathering from the implicit the force of form. This quality of the more than, that is technicity, is ineffable. It can be felt, but is very difficult to articulate in language. Return to proposition one. What research creation can do is make technicity palpable across registers. It can work as radical empiricism does in the complex field of conjunctions opened up by the transitions in experience. Return to proposition four. Seven, meta model, make it an event. What the conjunction between research and creation does is make apparent how modes of knowledge are always at cross currents with one another actively reorienting themselves in transversal operations of difference, emphasizing the deflection at the heart of each conjunction. The conjunction is at work, actively adjusting the always imminent coupling of research and creation, asking how the thinking in the act can be articulated and what kind of analogous experience it can be coupled with, asking how a making is a thinking in its own right, asking what a thinking might be able to do. Return to proposition one. A reorienting of thought as a practice in its own right is part of the creation and evaluation of or valuing of new forms of knowledge. In the final pages of his account on the function of reason, Whitehead writes, the quality of an act of experience is largely determined by the factor of the thinking which it contains. Challenging the habit of situating facts above thinking Quote, the basis of all authority is the supremacy of fact over thought, end quote. Whitehead inquires into the tendency to place thought outside experience. This, he suggests, is what is wrong with method. How might the fact of this occasion, what it does, how it feels, where it moves, be separated out by its thinking when thought itself is, quote, a factor in the fact of experience? Thinking in the event suggests that the machinations of appetition are at work and that they have thoroughgoing effects. Thought is a generative moment, momentation, a movement toward the activation and the resolution of processes. This transversal activation of relational fields of thinking and doing is what I am calling research creation. Research creation does not need new methods. What it needs are modes of valuing the process that can facilitate the creation of a lived vocabulary of how research creation makes a difference. If non-linguistic practices are forms of knowledge in their own right, as research creation makes apparent, how do we evaluate them? How do we value them? Guattari's concept of meta-modeling may be a a place to start considering how research creation, its thinking, its techniques, its relations, can be valued not for what they leave behind, but for their appetite to always begin anew. Meta-modeling makes felt lines of formation, starting not from one model in particular, 
but actively taking into account the plurality of models vying for fulfillment. Metamodeling is against method, active in its refutation of pre-existing modes of experience, quote, meta in the sense of mapping abstract formative conjunctions in continuing variation across varying deflections. Metamodeling shouldn't be thought as that which frames a process. It is radical empiricism in action. It is a technique for activating the lived abstractions in the event, for making felt the thinking at the heart of doing. As Guattari writes, Metamodeling delinks modeling with both its representational foundation and its mimetic reproduction. It softens signification by admitting asignifying forces into a model's territory. What was hitherto inaccept inaccessible is given room to manifest and project itself into new and creative ways and combinations. Metamodeling is in these respects much more precarious than modeling less and less attached to homogeneity, standard constraints, and the blinkers of apprehension. Eight, render formative forces, create a platform for relation. An event is by definition the field of relation. An event is how an ecology comes to be known as such. There is nothing outside the event. An event's relational force cannot be reproduced. It remains always a singular movement. It has a velocity uniquely played out from the initial conditions at hand. It is potentializing and renders potential. It follows the arc of a tendency working itself out. Return to proposition six. Tendencies are as singular as an event's generative force. They can be iteratively reactivated to variable effect, but each event will activate its own tendency. Return to proposition five. If you follow the technicity of singular tendings, you will be eventfully setting into motion a meta-modeling of emergence. Return to Proposition 7. A tendency meta-modeled is an incipient assemblage, a platform for relation. Consider that meta-modelings of generative processes are deterritorializing. They move tendentially across institutionalizations and morph them. An event of metamodeling must be self-expiring. It must creatively find ways to affirm its generative power in its passing. Do not imprison the event's formative forces. Follow them instead to see what they can do. Return to Proposition 4. 9. Create alter economies of value. Value emergence. We remain held by existing methods because we remain incapable or unwilling to evaluate knowledge on its own incipient terms, or better, to engage productively with new concepts of valuation. Return to Proposition 1. In a formal economy, valuation is quantitative and is derived using conventional measures. Monetary economy, of course, can only mean one thing, the capitalist economy. The capitalist economy taps into all other formal and informal economies in a continuously varied attempt to annex them to itself, which is to say, to its particular forms of formal valuation and indexing. The capitalist economy is not only a universal process of subsuming all forms of value to monetary valuation. It also formally builds into its definition of value an imperative to quantitative value adding. Capital is by definition money that grows more money. The capitalist economy is formally dedicated to quantitative growth over and above all other values. Capitalist techniques of relation are without exception mechanisms of accumulation. There are also informal economies. These revolve around assessments of value that are directly qualitative in nature and therefore vaguer and less easily indexed. This kind of valuation is often called prestige value. A formal economy also generates its own prestige value as a spin-off of its quantitative valuations, or it captures prestige value produced by informal economies, tapping into and annexing them to itself. All of this matters for the experimental practice of research creation because the universal subsumption of all other economies, formal and informal, under the capitalist economy amounts to a capture of every species of event including their respective fields of emergent expressibility, the heterogeneity of their co-composing polyrhythms, their improvisational power to repeat singularly with variation, 
their tendential arcs, their cresting expression on sur social surfaces of recording that constitute evolving genres of co-activity. When the capitalist economy subsumes all other economies, it is not just capturing monetary value. It is capturing processes of individuation. It is capturing entire fields of emergent relation. It is capturing powers of becoming. Capitalism endeavors nothing less than the universal capture of forms of life. It subsumes them, sometimes gently, more often brutally, to techniques of relation dedicated to quantitative value adding and accumulation. 10. Activate new forms of life. Invent at the interstices. It is important not to mistake this capture for a homogenization. The forms of life captured by the capitalist process produce value by distinguishing themselves from each other. Capitalism is as singularizing as it is subsuming. The issue is that the singularization is subject to competition in, ways that, in a way that foregrounds quantitative measures of success over the richness of qualitative diversity. The heterogeneity of forms of life are important only to the extent that they add capital value. Although the capitalist process creates the conditions for the singular emergence of forms of life and feeds off their heterogeneity, it ultimately attributes no value to them as such. It is supremely indifferent to the qualitative richness that animates its field. If capitalism is a universal process of capture, there is no simple way out. All activities are at some point, in some way, taken up in it. But if capitalism is also singularly inventive of new forms of relation, then despite this complicity, there are emergent forms of life always on the make, which might come to assert greater autonomy. The result can be leakage in the system, lines of flight toward a non-capitalist future. An alter economics of research creation, understood as a practice of the event, is informal. It is unquantifiable. Its valuations directly concern qualities of life. But the affirmation of qualities of experience refuses to settle around prestige value. Its process is autonomous in the sense that it is self-propagating. What propagates is an evolving form of life that partners thinking and making at the emergent level where they already come co-causally together. This is a polyrhythmic economy of germinal forms attuning, of forces of life finding new collective expression. Emergent life lived less as value adding than as a value in itself. Research creation, the value produced is the process itself in its very qualitative autonomy. Thank you.